Good evening, everyone. Thanks for, uh, thanks for braving the weather. Um, if you haven't grabbed a Bible, you might want to do that. You can go ahead and... There should be some over there. If you brought your Bible, awesome. Sometimes your phones have a Bible, so you got your Bible charged up. And uh, we'll just begin here in just a moment. Can you all hear me? Is this a little bit? Yes? No? In the back? Okay. So um, thanks again for, for coming out in, this, in the weather. Thanks to Mike for setting up the, the chairs and, and all that and taking away the fancy dance floorboard. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, so today we're going we're gonna to dig into scripture about Lazarus, right? And so this is John 11, um, and it's going to be, we're just going to pretty much go through the, almost the entire chapter of John 11 um, with Lazarus. Feel free to grab a Bible on the way in, guys. Let's go ahead and just say a prayer in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we thank you, we praise you, we bless you, we glorify you. We ask your Holy Spirit upon us, to all who are here, those who are listening, those who are watching, Open up our mind to, to know who you are and to know who we are in your eyes. Seal us, Jesus, in your Holy Spirit and give us the grace. Give us your love to see more fully the gift of God in our life. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Um, so this title, we titled it, we're continuing Liberated, and this week we're doing, this month we're doing Liberated For. Or what are we liberated for? Last, last time we were liberated from, and does anybody remember what we talked about? Liberated from, does anybody remember? Begins with a C, rhymes with daptivity. <laughs> captivity, right. We were liberated from captivity, and what are we liberated for, right? Salvation. Be amen, salvation. And in salvation, we often think like salvation is at the end. When I die, I get salvation. But Christ constantly says that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's at hand, meaning it's here, it's present, it's real, it's tangible. So we're, we're liberated for salvation, for life, so that we would have life and salvation in this time, in this period, so that we don't have to wait till we die to experience it. We're liberated for the glory of God. So if you want to open up your Bibles, uh, John chapter 11, the death of Lazarus. It says, Now a certain man was ill, Lazarus of Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. It was Mary who anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was ill. So the sisters sent to him, that is Jesus, saying, Lord, he whom you love is ill. But when Jesus heard it, he said, This illness is not unto death. It is for the glory of God, so that the Son of God may be glorified by means of it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his, the disciples, Let us go into Judea again. The disciples said to him, Rabbi, the Jews were but now seeking to stone you, and are you going there again? Jesus answered, Are there not twelve hours in the day? Don't you love when Jesus answers a question with a question? Are there not twelve hours in a day? And he never, like, seems to make sense, right? He never, like, answers it straight on. Are there not twelve hours in the day? If anyone walks in the day, he does not stumble because he sees the light of this world. But if anyone walks in the night, he stumbles because the light is not in him. Thus he spoke, and then he said to them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I go to wake him out of sleep. The disciples said to him, Lord, if he has fallen asleep, he will recover. Now Jesus had spoken of his death, but they thought that he meant taking rest and sleep. Then Jesus told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I am glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go, let us go to him. Thomas called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. 
Now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off, and when the Jews, many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them concerning their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary sat in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Who be- he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, he who is coming into the world. All right, I just want to pause there. I'm t- taking big chunks out of this. Let's just, let's just start at the beginning, right? There was a man who was ill, who's Lazarus, right? We know what happens to Lazarus at the end, right? Most of us, like, he's going to rise from the dead. Spoiler alert. Okay. So let's just, like, look at that first passage. Verse 5 and 6. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister, Mary, and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer. Can we just, like, that's so, like, can we just question what, what, what does that mean? So, when I am sick, my parents take care of me, so they go to the store, right? Like, the so usually intends, like, an understandable sequential sequence of events. But in this, it says he loves Martha and Mary and Lazarus so he decided not to go, right? Like, so he chose not to go when he found out that his friend was ill. Like, that doesn't make sense. That doesn't make sense. Like, it's, it's backwards. No, 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 Jesus. When you get an, a, a note that your friend is ill, you go to take care of them because, you know, everybody else on the planet who has to be healed, you healed, right? So, like, why wouldn't you do that for the one that you loved? The one that you loved. What does it say? Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that he was ill, he stayed two days longer in the place where he was. Then after this, he said to his disciples, let's go to Judea again. It's like this casual idea. And then, now to get the context, Jesus had already, he'd already started like, taken off the Jews. He'd already started poking their buttons, and they were pretty, pretty up in arms. And so what, what was he, what was it meant that he's going back to Judea? Like, that meant that they were going to try to find him. They were going to stone him. That's why Thomas intervenes, and he's like, all right, let's go back and let's die. Like, we're just going to, like, right? Not a believer, right? Like the doubter. But like, they're getting, he's getting at something that Understandably, Jesus had been in the country. He'd been doing miracles that had been frustrating the people of the, of, of, of the Pharisees, and, and they were already planning to do him harm. Now, we're going to find out after this, that's when they start to decide that, like, we're going to kill him. But before this, Jesus is already, he's already, like, rabble-rousing. He's already starting to, to get people to to be a little offended at everything that he says and everything that he does. And so he goes, he goes back and then he, what does he say? He says, our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep and I go to wake him out of sleep. The disciples said, Lord, if he's fallen asleep, he'll recover, right? Because they're not understanding that Lazarus has died. Can we ask what this means for us? Like his best friend, one of his best friends, he loved Lazarus. He allowed him to die. Sometimes being a friend of Jesus is very uncomfortable. It's very uncomfortable because things happen that you don't intend and that you can't control. Let's just say that's life. But when you rely upon Jesus, it makes it even more uncomfortable because you're told that you have a savior. And he's not doing the thing that he says he would do. Lord, you come to heal, and yet my family is still suffering. So, so those two things aren't equating in my mind. 
You said that you came to, we looked at Luke 4 last time, I came to set the, the prisoners free. Well, Lord, my, your friend is sick and he needs to be set free and you don't do squat. Lord, there's something in my life that I've been struggling with for years, for years. And why haven't you taken it away? Why haven't you taken away my thought process? Why haven't you taken away the people that hurt me? Like, why? Like, this is, this is a very raw moment, right? Like, again, we know the end. We know that Lazarus is going to rise from the dead. So, like, there's part of us that reads this and we're like, ah, it's all right, he's going to raise them from the dead. But if you put yourself in the moment, they didn't know that. They had no idea that he was going to raise them from the dead. And so there he is. And they're like, hey, Jesus, didn't you hear? Like, your friend Lazarus is still sick. He's like, yeah, I heard. You guys want a piece of pizza? It's like, <laughs> gee, like I was, here's what I was pondering. What sort of conversations are they having on the way? <laughs> like, like, so you knew that your friend Lazarus died? Yeah, I knew my friend Lazarus died. And you didn't do anything about it. Like, you didn't decide that you wanted to leave earlier? No, I decided I was going to stay. Why? So that the glory of God can be revealed. What does that mean, Jesus? Like, you're very mysterious in what you say. And yet, and we're going to get to it. Like, he, what did we say last time? Like, he does everything intentionally. Where he is and what he says is very intentional. Being Christian allows us into the same intentionality of Jesus. But I was using this example with, I think, the confirmation kids last week. Like, when people get engaged, they often are very intentional about how they get engaged right? Or people get married, like they're very intentional. They're just not like, well, there was a, a church we passed up on the way. Like that seemed like it was good. Like you want to do it tomorrow? Like, no, no. Like, I'm mean, okay. If you're going to lope, yes. Okay. That's like a way, you know, go get Elvis or whatever. But like, no, don't do that. I'm not actually promoting that. <laughs> like people watch this stuff and they send us emails and all those things. Anyway, so <laughs> like they think I'm serious. Uh, so, so when we, when we, we're, we're very intentional when we do things like that. And when we're Christian, we become even more intentional in our relationship with the Lord and with other people because we realize that the words that I speak, they have, they have weight, right? That when I speak a blessing to somebody, that affects them in a positive way. Why? Not because I've just spoken a good, positive, you know, you can do it. But when I speak a blessing, uh, a word of affirmation, I'm speaking in the person of Christ because I'm Christian. In my baptism, I'm Christian. I'm Christ. So I speak a word of blessing and it affects them and it builds them up inside. When I speak a curse word, and I don't mean swearing, I mean when I say to somebody, you're a piece of blank, um, or when somebody cuts you off, okay, let's, we won't call out names. Uh, <laughs> like when somebody cuts us off and we get all offended and we're like, I hope you, blank, 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 blank. Like what happens? That's a word of, that's a, a harsh word that's not just being spoken in our person, but it's, and why do we confess it, right? Be like, oh, I did something bad. No, because I've, I've, I've offended the very person of Jesus within me, that the person of Jesus within me is speaking those words because I am, I am Christ. I am, I am Jesus in my baptism. So I can't like distinguish like when I go to church, I'm a Christian, or when I'm getting cut off by some maniac in a car, like then I'm, I'm going to be not a Christian. No, like the two are inter, interconnected all the time. So when I do those things, um, it doesn't act as just like a harsh word or a blessing or a good word. It acts as a curse or a blessing. Um, and so those, those are things that we, we, take, uh, we take stock of because uh, we're intentional. We're intentional about what we do because Christ was intentional about everything that he did. He literally stayed where he was, knowing that his friend was going to die and that he died for, for another two days. He literally, he stayed there knowing that his friend was going to die. Right? That's, just, that's just mean, right? Like, if your kid was sick and they're like, could I, could I get some medicine? You're like, give me four hours. <laughs> like, no, 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 can I get it now? I'll give it to you tomorrow. Like, it almost seems, it's, it's counterintuitive. But the Lord is so intentional that he wants to raise our understanding of who he is. Why? Because they understood him as healer, but they didn't understand him as life. They understood him that he could heal people, 
but they didn't understood that, stand that he was the resurrection and the life. And we're going to get to that. So hear me, they, they understood him in one way. We understand Christ to the, to the amount that we've encountered him. I know him to be a good person. Why? Because that's what I hear about him in church. That's what I've been taught about him in school. I don't know him to be a savior who re, ra, ra, raises people from the dead because I've never seen that. So my faith isn't at that level. So Jesus, what he's about to do is raise our understanding of who he is, because in raising our understanding of who he is, he raises our, under, our own faith, right? It, it, it starts from within us. But that gift of faith, it's not coming from abstract. It's from within us at our baptism. So let's continue. So there he goes, uh, Lazarus is dead, and for your sake, I am glad. Again, this is either crazy Jesus uh, or he's intentional. For your sake, I am glad that I was not there, so that you may believe, that you may believe. But let us go to him. Let us go to him. So now we get to, uh, Martha says to him in, in verse 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. There's something so amazing about that statement. No, like, Lord, if you'd been here, G Lazarus wouldn't have died. There's a confidence in understanding who Jesus is. Why? Because they've seen him work miracles. They've seen him heal people. So there she is. She runs up to meet him, right? She heard he was coming. She runs out to meet him, and she's like, now, let's be serious. I can't imagine Martha, the anxious worrier, coming to Jesus and being like, Lord, if you had been here, my brother simply would not have died, right? Like, and often when we think about with this passage, I think we can like think about it in that mindset. Like, it's very clean, right? Nothing about the Gospels is clean, right? We have the clean crucifix because we're all Puritan and like, like we, want, we don't want the dirty, the messy, but it's, it's raw, right? Here's Martha. Her brother just died. And I don't know if you've, ever, if you've ever experienced death, which many of us have, there's a raw emotion that often when we, when we go to God, there's the question of like, WTF? Why? Why did they have to die? I don't understand. Even if it's somebody who's, who's, who's like later in years and has passed, and like, why did they have to die then? There's like this rawness to Martha. She runs up and says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother wouldn't have died. And I'm sure as hell sure of that because you're Jesus. And I know that, that you've healed people. And if you've healed them who you didn't even know, surely you would heal him because you loved him. There's this, there's this, there's this raw emotion tied into the total understanding of who Jesus is as healer but a lack of understanding of who he is as the resurrection, as the Savior. And so here he is, and what does he say? What is his response? Oh, yeah. Before we get to his response, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And get this, and even now, let's look at those words, even now, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. That's a really powerful statement, even now. There's something in that statement about Martha that says, I know you to be healer, but I know you to be so much more, but I don't know how you're going to be that in this moment. But even now, Jesus, if you ask, whatever you ask, because I, I've heard you pray before, Right? This is like Jesus sitting with Martha and Mary and Mary and Martha, Martha doing the dishes and getting angry. Like he's been to their house before. This isn't a first time occurrence. She, she's heard him speak. She's heard him pray. Right? It, it, it was part of their, their, their friendship that, that she had the privilege of being surrounded by him. And so she says, even now I know, I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. And I don't know what that is right now, because right now my mind is consumed with the death of my brother, but I am sure that something will happen if you ask God. And Jesus says to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha says, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Now understand that the Jews debated 
whether or not there was a resurrection, right? They debated whether or not there was a resurrection. And it's very, it's very funny because Paul, if you read, um, it's in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, he gets before the Pharisees and Sadducees and uh, he realizes that like, they all want to put him to death. And the Pharisees, I think, were the ones who believed in the resurrection. The Sadducees didn't. I'm not quite sure which one it was. But Paul then says, why would you want to put me to death? I'm simply arguing that there is a resurrection of, of, of the body, a, a resurrection after, after death. And the Pharisees, who side with Paul, are like, oh, if that's all he's arguing, then yeah, we shouldn't put him to death. And then the Sadducees get all like up in arms. And then the, the, two, the two groups start fighting and Paul like sneaks out. <laughs> like, you know, it's like pin my enemies against my enemies and then I get to, I get to leave. Uh, so it's really, it's, it's, it's fascinating. But the, the Jews were, were so consumed with this question. Um, so Martha obviously was on the side, Christ had already spoken to her about that. And so here he says, he will rise, and she says, I, will, he, I know that he'll rise on the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who is coming into the world. There's few times in the Gospels that that proclamation is said, right? Peter says, it, you are the Christ. You are the Christ. Right? And then there's the woman at the well where Jesus says to her, she says, I know that there's a Christ who's coming and says, I am that one that is coming. There's a few times, and then it's like Caiaphas and the high priest when, when he says, you know, are you the Christ, the son of the living God? And he says, I am, and you shall see me ascending on the throne up to the, the clouds of heaven. So this proclamation is, is key because, again, it's, it's understanding who Martha understood Jesus to be. Right? And everything about the scriptures is telling us who is Jesus, who is Jesus, and who is Jesus to us. Right? It's not just that he was a good dude, but there's something about who he is and who he reveals himself to be. And he says, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. It's not that I just, I make resurrection happen. But it's, and I was saying this at Mass tonight, it's part of his, his, it's a part of his being that you can't separate resurrection of Jesus as an action of Jesus and like, oh, there was like Jesus who walked on water and there was Jesus who like had good things to say, excuse me, and like talked about parables and then there was Jesus who like did the thing about resurrecting from the dead. No, he says, I am. Right, when I say I am, Sean Grismer, that's my identity. When I say I am a priest, that's my identity. I can say, I, I, I am uh, um, good at this or that or the other thing, but those are, those are qualities that are attributed to me. But those other things are essential to who I am. And so sometimes it's worth praying, if you just want to sit with a small passage, sit with that passage. I am the resurrection and the life. That's it. And just repeat that over and over and over again. I am the resurrection and the life. And like, what, is that, what does that mean, Jesus? And allow that, if, if, if it, remember, if it belongs to Christ and you are in Christ, then it belongs to you. All right? Now, a lot of our, a lot of our faith is going to say, or a lot of our mind is going to start pushing back and be like, well, I can't raise anybody from the dead and I, I, I can't raise myself from the dead. It's like, no, that's true. But when you start remembering that you are in Christ and anything that belongs to Christ belongs to you. So when you pray that prayer, I am the resurrection and the life, you're not, you're not boasting as if you have some magnificent power. No, that, that Christ is, is, will rise within you. He will rise within you. He will allow your soul, your spirit, your body to rise. And, and here's the thing. He allows that in this life within our spirit and our soul. And the resurrection of the body will happen in the next life. Right? That our bodies and our souls will be brought back together. All right. So then, so we finish this, this conversation with Martha. And what does it say? Verse 28. When he, she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying quietly, Hey, the teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. 
When the Jews who were with her in the house, consoling her, saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing that she was going to the tomb there to weep. So then Mary, when she came where Jesus was and saw him, fell at his feet, saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Hmm, that sounds familiar. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. And he said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Shortest verse in all of Scripture, right there. Jesus wept. Shortest verse of all in all of Scripture. So the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, could not, he, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? All right, we're just digging right into that. Like, here he is. And he goes, and, and what is, but what's, what's beautiful about this is that he waits for Mary. Martha goes, right? Jesus is on a mission to raise Lazarus from the dead. But he doesn't allow himself to be in such a hurry that he bypasses the emotions of those that he loves. He's on a mission to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he's not in such a hurry that he bypasses the emotions of those that he loves. So he waits in the place where he was with Martha. So Mary comes up, and what does she say? The exact same thing. Why? Probably because there was a previous conversation that there was like, yeah, if Jesus had been here, he could have, he could have saved Lazarus. Yeah, that the, right? Like, there was, there was some like harsh words, and you can hear that pain in Mary. It's the same words that Martha said, right? There's, there's an understanding of who Jesus is as healer, right? And even from the crowd later on, in verse, verse 37, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? They know him to be somebody who heals, but they don't know him yet to be somebody who rises people from the dead. Right? But this is, this is the expanding of the faith that Jesus wants to give to his people. And Jesus wept. But here's the thing. He didn't tell Mary to stop weeping. He deeply cares about our emotions. Sometimes... The only time that we can actually converse with the Lord is when we're raw with our emotion with him. I, I don't know if their emotion was anger, but I, I, would, I would believe that some of it was. And so for us as Christians, we, we want to make everything so nice and tidy. And we don't want to get mad at the Lord. Like, it's okay to get angry at him. It's okay to be upset that things are going wrong. It's okay to tell him, like, Lord, you have the power to heal and you didn't. Right? There's like, there's a little bitterness there. There's a little hurt. But he's not affected by it like we would imagine. It's not going to be like the, however your parents raised you or whatever teacher or coach or whatever, like, it's not going to be the same reaction that you had when, when somebody came. Like, we, we've been so affected by what other people respond to us that when I get angry in normal life, people are like, oh, like, you're not allowed to get angry, right? Like, it's not okay to get angry. But Jesus doesn't stop her from getting angry. He just says, where have you laid him? He lets her come with her raw emotion to where he was, and then... He says, take me. Take me to the place where you laid him. There's something like, like the Lord, uh, there's something so beautiful about that. And, and we're going to see that the Lord doesn't necessarily care about our excuses. All right, so Mary is there. She comes to the Lord and she says, Lord, if you'd been here, my brother wouldn't have died. Again, tells us about our faith and tells us about an understanding of who Jesus is. And then he says, take me, take me there. And then he weeps. Have you ever let Jesus just weep with you? Like, have you ever just let him, like, cry with you? Because this is where, this is where relationship gets real. Right? Think about when you were a kid and you were hurting and your mom or your dad like cried with you. 
right? Because what is it? Like they, they didn't have the ability to necessarily take away your pain. Right? Now the question is, why does Jesus weep? And there's, there's a great love that he has. And as he sees those around him weeping, and as he knows that, that death is a separation, like death is, we get it, death is unnatural. Right? The, the question that we ask is why, and it's a wrong question. Right? It's a silly question because God's never going to answer why in this life. Right? So we ask it, and then we get all angry that he doesn't answer it. It's like, well, he's not going to answer it. Right? So like, the better question is, what, what have you to do with this, Lord? Where are you, what are you teaching me in this? Because like when, when we ask the question why, like, all right, let's just go back to that. When Jesus weeps, he's allowing this to show us first off that he's, there's, there's a humanness, right? 100% human, 100% divine. He's not, not affected by, by other people's emotions, right? So like, let me put that in the positive. He's affected by our emotions, he loves it when we express our emotion because then he, he's able to enter into that with us. And he's not one to be like, you know, you are, you shouldn't be sad. You know, I'm, I'm the resurrection and the life. Don't be sad. He doesn't say that. He'll show us his power. He'll show us his glory. But we have to be willing to be raw with him because that's the only way that relationship actually builds in foundation. When I go into prayer and I have a, a facade on, and I'm like, God, you're so good, and I'm so, you know, I'm, I'm all right, you know, and like, we're, you know, we're tight, right? Like, you know, like everything's going well. And he's like, but you were just complaining to, you know, Sally about, you know, how hard life is. It's like, yeah, yeah, but that was a different conversation, and she just needed to know that she wasn't alone. And you know, I was like, no, life is hard. And it's okay for me to, like, admit that to the Lord. And I think that's, that's something that's very beautiful that Mary and Martha both exhibit. Because they were friends with him, they knew, like, he actually cared about them. He cared about them. And, and that's the other thing. If, <laughs> if I hear another time, oh, he's got too many other things to worry about, I want to be like, that's the biggest load of BS ever. Read anywhere in the scripture, never does God say, I don't have time for you. Right? No. Never does he say that to anybody. Ever. He is so madly in love with us, and he's so concerned about your emotion, that when we say, oh, yeah, well, God's just too busy, you know what that is? It's a lack of faith and a lack of understanding of who he is, all right? It's a lack of understanding. It's a lack of faith, right? God's not too busy for you, right? There's seven billion people in the world, and somehow, in the ability of being God, he has the ability to communicate with every one of us. It's why every one of us could have a different moment of prayer in this moment or when we're at mass or any, when we're in our room. Like, in those moments, we're communicating with God. He cares about you. He deeply cares and he loves you. And that's, that's like, if that's the only thing that we ever come away with in this life, like, we, we're doing pretty good. Like, I remember, and I shared this story before, but, but I remember when I was in second grade, our teacher took us into the narthex, and she had us lay down or sit down and close our eyes, and, um, and she read us the story of the woman at the well, and she said, and then it was like, it was Lexio Divina, you know, put, your, put yourself in the story and imagine Jesus says something to you. And Jesus, and I was like, all right, Jesus, what do you want to say? And he's like, I love you. And I'm like, mm-hmm, good. Can you tell me something else? And he's like, Sean, I love you. And I was like, no, 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 no. Like, see Matthew over there? I want to know what, what's going on in his life. I want to know his sins. Can you, like, tell me what his sins are? And he's like, Sean, I love you. And I'm like, oh, this isn't working, right? And, like, I gave up on that, right? Because, because I didn't understand that the basic and the first principle of relationship is knowing that the other person loves me, right? And so then I went through, like, however many years, thinking like, God doesn't really, that doesn't really have time for me. God doesn't really love me. No, he's like, hey, I was telling you in second grade, like, you just chose not to listen. <laughs> it's like, oh, all right, right? Like, and he still reminds me. He has to. He has to, because so often, it's so easy to let the weight of the world affect, affect my understanding of who I am in God's eyes. Like, some of the most beautiful moments for me is, is lifting up the Eucharist, and then the Lord's speaking, like, those words, like, I love you. And I'm like, yeah, but why, right? <laughs> like, like, I, like, why? Like, there's that question, why? Like, I don't deserve it. I didn't earn it. He's like, no, I know, but I love you. 
And like when we start to hear the words of the Lord speak those words, speak that to us, we start to understand uh, the, the 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 reality of who we are. But we are st- under, start to understand the gravity of God's love for us, right? And I spoke about this last time. Like He is willing to move mountains for the sake of of letting you know that 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 He loves you, right? Again, I'm just going to put it out there. The movie Taken. I encourage you to watch it because it's the greatest depiction of God the Father going after His children. Um, if you haven't seen it, it's a little rough. Little, I think it's R-rated, but I still think it's, is it R-rated? Anybody want to vouch for that? Yes, it's R-rated. Uh, so, <laughs> so for those who are under 18, uh, wait, or with your parental permission. But it's a depiction of God's love that, this is Romans 8, right? If you want, like, if you want to look at Romans 8, I remember seeing a, an image of Romans 8. Um, I was in a Methodist church for a funeral. Um, and I saw this image of of Christ on the ledge of a mountain and he's reaching down and he's going to grab a a lamb that had, you know, the lamb who had gone astray and he's holding on to the ledge, he's grabbing the lamb and in the distance are two vultures coming up and I thought it was just one of the most powerful images and at the end of of Romans 8 he says, no, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. What's the first thing that he says in that? That neither, what's the first word that he says? Of all the lists that he lists, death. Everybody say death. Death. Neither what? Death. Death. Death cannot separate us from the love of God. And this is what he's about to prove in John 11, right? And this is where, like, when, going back to that movie reference, that there's, there's nothing that will prevent God from getting to you. There's that song out by Corey Asbury that's the reckless love, right? Reckless love of God. Uh, and it's, it's a really powerful image. The ferocity of God's love for us is, is tremendous. Um, it's unexplainable, but it is experiential, and when we start to see that, then our lives begin to change because our lives, our faith is expanded. All right, so we're going back to, to John 11. Verse 38, Then Jesus, deeply moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay upon it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there will be an odor, for he has been dead four days. Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you would believe, you would, only, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you, all, I knew that you always hear me, but I have said this on account of the people standing by, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with bandages and his face wrapped with a cloth. Jesus said to them, unbind him and let him go. Jesus says, take away the stone. And what what does Martha say? Was it Martha? Yeah. What does she say? Lord, there's going to be a stench. He's been dead four days. That means decomposition has already taken effect. Can we not, can we not move away the stone? Can you just Can you just say your prayer that you're going to say so we could all feel better about ourselves? Like, how many times is that what people really ask for? Like, can you just, like, and I think this is where we get caught up as Christians. We think when I pray with somebody, I'm just praying so that everybody feels better, right? And so, like, people will come and be like, Father, can you just pray that I feel better? It's like, no, I'm going to pray that Jesus takes that away because he has authority over that sickness. He has authority over the cancer. He has authority over the broken bone. He has authority over these things. Because be, before every, before the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, every tongue profess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if he's Lord, it means he's Lord of everything, not just a couple of things. So prayer isn't just to make us feel better, okay? Like, when we start to see that prayer is an understanding of who God is, in proclaiming that into people's lives, lives begin to change. I don't just pray for you so that you feel like the good butterflies within you, right? That would be silly and stupid, and my life would be a waste, 
right? It's like, why did you become a priest? Because I really want to make other people feel good about themselves and have them have butterfly feelings. Like, oh, gosh, no, like, go to Hallmark for that, right? Where's the Hallmark people? There we are. <laughs> right? Like, like, that's not what we're here for. No, prayer is doing what Jesus did. Father, I know that you always hear me, and I know that you're bigger than death itself. Therefore, I have said these things, and I have waited four days for this man to die. Gosh, it took him a long time. He waited four days for this man to die so that you could be glorified, so that they would know who you are. This is a proclamation of who God is. Jesus is trying to reveal in this moment who God is. Not just about good feelings and like, that's what Martha wants. Martha just wants him, right? She's like, Jesus, could you just say your couple prayers and then we could all have like our little morning session and we could all be on our way. It's like, I didn't wait for Lazarus to die just for us to say a couple nice words so we could have a nice eulogy about who he was. No, I came to give him life, to breathe life into him. I came to raise him from the dead. There are things in our lives that need to be raised from the dead. There's faith within our life that needs to be raised from the dead. The faith in our life that people have pooped upon in our life that said, no, you're just, you're no good. And so we start to believe these mindsets that I'm no good, that I'm, 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 I'm forgotten, I'm abandoned, I'm alone, I'm hurt, I'm never going to be good enough, uh, I'm, 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 I'm abused and I'm always going to be abused. I'm a victim and I'm always going to be a victim. These are things that decrease our faith, right? Because they're attacks of the enemy upon the life of Jesus Christ within us. And this is what Jesus has come to raise us from, right? We could have all had really, really crappy upbringings. And some of us did. Some of us had really rough upbringings. But neither death nor life nor angels, nor demons, nor anything else can separate us from the love of God. And the love of God is life, which means whatever has been dead in your life, whatever lies have been believed, whatever times in your life you think like, I wish that just never happened, let's not even talk about it, and when somebody brings it up, you get all up in arms, like that, that's what Jesus wants to touch. Mm, but the stench, Lord, is a little bit too much. Yeah. I know. But Jesus isn't afraid of the stench. He's not afraid of the pain. We are, because the only time we've ever experienced that moment in our life is in pain. Right? The, the only time we've ever experienced those moments is, is in pain, because we haven't had the Lord. But the Lord is, there's a beautiful prayer in the, in the extraordinary form of the Mass, in the Latin Mass, there's a prayer that was prayed when the priest, after the Our Father, before we say, for the kingdom, the glory, the power, there's a prayer that says, deliver us, Lord, from, from every evil um, and grant us peace in our days. There's a line that they took out in the, in the Second Vatican Council that said, deliver us, Lord, from every evil, past, present, and future. Um, and they took it out because they wanted to avoid re re uh, repetitiveness, which they thought, like, every evil, well, everybody knows that that means past, present, and future. But the, the intentionality of those words, past, present, and future, reminds us that God has the ability to preserve us from the past moments of evil that have afflicted us. How does he do it? Right? He's given us the gift of our memory and our imagination. He's given us the gift of our memory, and he is the God of the past. Which means whatever pain I experienced in those memories, he can heal. Whatever abuse I've suffered in the past, he can heal. He heals it in your person, in who you are. We have to be willing to go there, into the stench. It's painful and it's hurtful because we start to feel all of those emotions all up, up, up there again. And the Lord says, I know, but I want to heal that. And I don't just want to heal it, I want to raise it. And I want to raise you. I want to give you a different mindset. St. Paul says we have to put on the mind of Christ, right? And so in 2000, people came up with that brilliant phrase, WWJD, what would Jesus do, right? And so that helps us with our actions. What would Jesus do? Should you take out the trash? What would Jesus do, right? And you're like, that's just, I just feel guilted into doing something. <laughs> like, that's not Jesus, right? Guilt, like, 
that's not like, well, should I go to Father Grismer's talk or should I not? Well, what would Jesus do? Be like, he'd stay away from it, right? <laughs> like, just kidding. Uh, no, like, like he, he, he doesn't guilt us into things. But the WWJD simply is a, is a reference to the external understanding of who Jesus is, rather than letting Jesus begin to heal us from, from within. He wants to go back, the past. Why? Because he's still there. When you, when you experienced the, the, the abuse by your father, when, when you were in your room and nobody else heard your cry, Jesus heard that. He heard it. And that's like, he, that's what he wants to heal. And he doesn't just heal it by like a nice imaginatory, like, okay, he wisps it away. We have to be willing to go back to that place in our memory and invite Jesus to be there with us and then let him have that control. Martha and Mary didn't go into the tomb. They simply did what Jesus said. They rolled away the stone and then Jesus said, Lazarus, come out. The abuse that you suffered from your girlfriend or your boyfriend, like it was unjust and it was unfair. And I'm not saying that Jesus takes away these things, but he takes away the pain that we have lived with and we have come to live with and we've accepted. Well, it's just part of my story. Yeah, that, that whole scene was part of your story, but you don't have to live with the pain and act out of that pain, which prevents me from trusting other people, which prevents me from trusting the people that I ought to be loving. When I, when I am entering into those moments, I'm not going in alone. I'm going in with the one who is the resurrection and the life. And so what does he do? He goes back into the darkness and into the death. And here's where the beautiful part is. Like I was meditating on what was, what was Lazarus's last moment like? It's like, hey, is Jesus here yet? No, we let him know. He hasn't showed up. Is Jesus, is, this, is he here yet? Like this anticipation of Jesus. And how many of us are like, Jesus, are you showing up yet? Are you showing up yet? And he's like, would you die already? I want to raise you from the dead. I don't want to just heal you. I want to raise you from the dead. I don't want to just make, work, make it so that everything's normal. This is what Martha and Mary were asking. Jesus, if you had been here, my, my brother wouldn't have died. Everything could have gone back to being as normal as it was. God doesn't care about things being normal. He doesn't want life to be normal. He didn't say, I have come so that they could have a normal life. He said, I have come that they would have life in abundance, life greater than normal life, that you would have life that is within you that other people can't comprehend. That's having an abundance. When you see somebody with a lot of money and they're like using it well, you're like, I can't comprehend how you have this house because I don't have that house. I can't comprehend how you gained all these millions of dollars. I can't comprehend how you have these things. When we talk about Jesus and giving us life, it's hard to comprehend what he means when all we've been dealt with and all that we've been promised is a normal life. He didn't come to give us a normal life. He came to give us a life of extravagant goodness. And some say it's too good to be true. But when we look at what he does with Lazarus, he raises him from the dead. Why? The Jews, the Jews prayed the Psalms consistently, right? We pray the Psalms at Mass. But Psalm 23, Though I walk in the valley of darkness, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. And I don't know, but I could imagine that Lazarus was praying that. Lord, as I walk through the valley of darkness, I fear no evil, for you are at my side. For you set a table before me in the sight of my enemies. There's just this utter confidence in Lazarus. The Lord, I, I don't know how you will, but I believe that you will. What Martha says, even now, Lord, I believe that whatever you ask of God will be given to you. So even as Lazarus was falling asleep in death, could it possibly be that he had the confidence in Christ? So when Christ came, and it's not recorded, right? This is where our imagination can come in. And, and Jesus says, Lazarus, come out. He comes out and he says, unbind him. And he takes off the thing and he says, I knew you would come. I knew it. 
because you are a faithful friend. You are a faithful friend. Right? Like, again, it's not in Scripture, right? So don't, like, be like, Father Grismer said that. This is what Lazarus said, right? Like, I'm not saying that that's verbatim, but I am saying that in, it is in the realm of possibility of friendship that says, I knew you would show up. I have trust that you would show up because that's who you are. You never let me down. And that's who Christ is. He never lets us down. But perhaps what we've been waiting for in our life is a healing, and he hasn't wanted to give us a healing. He wants to give us a resurrection. So often people are like, it's so hard because these things are happening. My, my son or my daughter or my mom or my dad, they're, they're abandoned the faith and they don't believe in like, will they ever come back? I keep giving them pamphlets. Stop giving them pamphlets, right? <laughs> like, like, you hear me talk about it all the time, right? But it's because there's, there's something to allowing, allowing the death to happen. Allowing the death of that, like, I'm going to let that, that part die so that Jesus can raise it. But what if he wants to raise it through me, Father? He may want to raise it through you, but in your anxiety is not how he raises it. He doesn't raise it by, by, by through the anxious soul. He raises it when we come to understand who he is. And so when we come to understand that he will work miracles, and greater miracles such as a resurrection, then we start to be more confident in letting him enter into everything of our life past, present, and future. Lord, I, I'm going to go through a very dark period because they're about to fire me from my job and, and I don't know what's about to happen, but I believe you're the, resurrect and, you're the re resurrection and the life. So I believe that whatever happens, you will make good. You will make good because that's who you are. It's all about revealing who he is and who we are to him. And the last thing is that he's not, it's not this like, he says he, he wants to reveal the glory of God. It's not that he's, he wants us to like prove to ourselves or to others. This isn't the resurrection that we're talking about. It's not like I have to prove to myself or to the people that most hurt me. Or people are like, um, like I think, I think it was MJ uh, who, when Michael Jordan, for those, yeah, Michael Jordan, sorry, uh, who when he like got his Hall of Fame speech, he like invited, I was told this, I haven't watched this video, but I like to, but like he invited the, the coach who like cut him from the high school basketball team. And he's like, and to you, mister. And he like lays it into him. Like I'm the, I'm the most BA person that ever lived, right? Like that's not what we're talking about. That's not the resurrection. When we like accomplish something ourselves, that's not the resurrection. The resurrection is when Christ accomplishes it in our life and when he heals the places of our heart. Jesus doesn't care about the odor because he's conquered that. He's conquered death and everything that entails. And he wants to speak life into the area of your life that has been living in death. So we talked about last time, the man who's beating himself at the tombs. And this time, he's liberated, not, he's not just from captivity, but from death for salvation. Right? And, and there's the bandages that, that he has them unbind. And I don't believe that they would have thrown those away. Maybe they would have, but, but they would have been a perpetual reminder that he who once slept in death now lives. Right? Our, the parts, and I said this before, but are the parts of our life that Jesus heals and raises from the dead, it's not like they cease to exist. They still exist, but the pain, the suffering, that no longer exists with them. Jesus' wounds, they still existed after his resurrection, but it was no longer in pain. It was in glory. And what's brilliant about this ending of the passage, if you read the last section, um, is that's when they say, we should go and we should kill Jesus, right? The resurrection, and then they say, it says in there, and they wanted to kill Lazarus too. Like, did you not just see what Jesus did? Like, <laughs> he raised them from the dead. You have no power over death. Like, you have no power to kill because Jesus is more powerful than that. Right? Like, there's an absurdity that the Pharisees say, we should go and kill Jesus. Oh, by, we should, by the way, we should kill Lazarus too. It's like, he was just dead. <laughs> and now, you're, now you're, you want to kill him again because you haven't learned. When our hearts are hardened, we won't learn who Jesus is. 
we'll see the things, we'll be offended by them. Everybody's offended, right? But, but when, when our hearts are soft, we understand this is him speaking to who he is and who he wants to be for me. All right, so let's say a prayer. God, we thank you. We praise you because you are the resurrection and the life. And Lord, I pray for the gift of the resurrection in the lives of these men and women in this room, those who are watching. Lord, I pray for the gift of the Holy Spirit to raise the parts of their lives that have been living in the spirit of death, that have been living in, in the death of sin, in the stench of death. And I pray, Lord, that you would reveal to them who you are over death, that you are the life, and that there is nothing that will prevent you from seeking them out, and that your love for them casts out fear, that your love from them for them banishes fear, so that when they are afraid to enter into that moment of death that was thrust upon them in their youth or in their life, that they have no fear because you are with them. And Lord, I proclaim the victory of your cross, but I proclaim the victory of your resurrection over and above and in and through the lives of those here so that they experience the redemptive gift of God's love that no longer do they have to live in the shadow of death, but rather that they walk confidently knowing that you are with them. Jesus, I proclaim this upon them. I seal it in the precious blood of Jesus, in the mantle of Mary, and in your holy name. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you have any questions, Shirley has this microphone here, this handy-duty microphone. So if you have any questions, if you have to leave or you'd like to leave, you're welcome to leave at this time. Um, but if anybody has questions, She'll walk around with the microphone. Um, one, of, one of the verses um, confused me a little bit. Sure. And that is where, let's see what it says, um, where Martha says, okay, but even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give that which you ask. Yeah. So the question is, did she have an understanding that there were more than one person in God? So why would she be asking that you know Jesus mm. to go to God yeah. if she knew that he was God? That's great. That's a great question. Um, yeah, so the question gets at the heart of did she know if there was more than one person in the in the Trinity. Um, I don't know. I think I think that in her asking, like even I think of other passages where Jesus speaks, and like even there he says, "Father, I am praying that um, that they would hear my prayer, that they would know that I, I don't have to pray out loud, but I'm going to because it's it's helping them understand who you are." Right? And so even she confesses, like, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. So there was a, a minimal understanding of what that meant. There was a, many interpretations of, like, what does it mean to be the Christ? Because the Christ was the anointed, which meant that he was meant, sent from God to deliver us. Um, but whether or not they understood that Christ Jesus was the, the living Son of God, that was... I, I don't know if, if she would have known that, or if she's like, you're the Christ, which means you are like the closest thing to God and you are from God somehow. But whether he was like, by the way, my mother Mary, she was immaculately conceived and she conceived me in her womb without Joseph. <laughs> like, I don't, I don't know if that conversation took place, but she had an understanding of his, of his divine power. But whether or not she understood him in his divinity, I don't know. But it seems to allude that she, she knows him to have that some essence of divinity. It's a great question. Yeah. Other questions? So you mentioned inviting Jesus into previous hurts or memories to heal those. Yes. So let's say I'm having a conversation with a friend and explaining this. How yeah. would I model that kind of prayer? Can you model 
not knowing that there's not a perfect prayer, can, but can you model that prayer experience, how we would talk about that and invite Jesus in? Sure, yeah. Um, there was a, a period in which the Lord was having me forgive, and I've said this before, but uh, forgive all the kids in my grade school, right? Because there's a lot of, I mean, you know, there's a lot of words exchanged in grade school. You're spending eight hours a day for five days a week for eight years with the same people. <laughs> uh, and so I, for, this, for this prayer, what the Lord was having me do is um, go back to, and for, let's say, particular people. Um, he would have me go back into a, a moment that that person hurt me, right? And like, let's say, uh, you know, Tommy was there and, and I saw Tommy and Tommy said something really hurtful to me. So I, I go back to that memory and I even hear those words, and I, and I, but I allow myself to experience, like, we, we want to say I want to forgive somebody, but unless we allow ourselves to forgive from the place of pain, it's not really forgiveness, right? We often say, well, how do I know if I've forgiven somebody? It's because, well, the pain isn't there, and, and that I'm no longer holding a grudge. So, like, let's say it was Tommy, right? And so I go back, and I, and I feel the pain that his words set, hurt me. And from that place, I say, like, Lord, I want to I invite you into this moment and show me where you are. And so then I just sit, wait, and listen, right? I just sit. And it's about my, my, my imagination. This is how the Lord uses our imagination. We, like, throw off the imagination as we're kids. And, like, after a certain couple of things, we're like, oh, I guess the imagination is, you know, useless. No, God has given that to us as a gift. So there I am. And, and let's say, um, let's say fourth grade, I got glasses and, He's like, hey, four eyes, right? Uh, like, that hurt. So what do I do is, I said, Lord, where are you in this? And I just wait, where, where are you, Jesus? Where do I see Jesus? Maybe he's, maybe he's behind Tommy. Maybe he's behind me. Maybe he has his hands on my shoulders. And Jesus, how, how do you want me to, to pray in this? Like, what do you want me to do? Maybe Jesus says, I want you to forgive him. Because he didn't really know what he was saying. He didn't know that those words were going to hurt you. So, okay, Jesus, because you're there now, I can do this. So, Jesus, I forgive him because he said those words and he didn't mean, he didn't mean to hurt me. So, uh, so then I'm able to, to allow that moment to be transformed, right? And so there I am. And um, is there anything else, Jesus, that, that has to happen or... You know, maybe, maybe then the, the, the imagination sort of takes over and all of a sudden, like, you're giving Tommy a handshake or, like, giving him a hug. And that, that's a moment of healing. That's a, 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 just an understanding in a natural way that there's some sort of reciprocity there. I never have to call Tommy and be like, hey, by the way, Tommy, I forgave you. And guess what? Jesus really loves you. And, like, we're all on this Jesus freak, you know, moment now. Like, that, that doesn't have to happen. But the healing has to happen within me. But because, let's say, like, that, that experience caused me to uh, be very sensitive to when people, like, would comment on me having glasses, right? Like, that would, so, so that's what Jesus is beginning to heal. We think, well, it's just a memory. No, 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 no. That predicated the rest of my, my experience of people calling me four eyes or commenting on my glasses. Therefore, what he's done is raised that part of me that, that was living in death, raised it to life, so now people are commenting, and I'm like, huh, I'm not affected by it anymore. Because he healed the root of it. The core wound of it was healed. So when you're explaining, so to model it to your friends or to, to somebody maybe that doesn't have a live experience, um, a lot of it just comes into, into to finding a place and, and sitting and waiting and, and listening and imagining, Jesus, where are you? You have an imagination. That's not like, it's not like, I'm creating something up here. Like, we all have imaginations. Like, I want you to picture your house right now. There it is. That's your imagination. You already have it. Like, we just don't activate it often, right? And, and, or maybe we do, but we just, like, let ourselves daydream. So this is to have a control, but also surrender that control to the Lord, and he's able to work through the imagination to heal the soul within us. It's fascinating. Yeah, does that help? Is that, is that a good example? Okay. Any other questions? Up, up here, Shirley. Okay. 
in verse 15, mm -hmm. it says, And I am glad for you that I was not there, that you may believe. Let us go to him. I was a little confused because he's waiting to see his best friend that's ill, and his disciples are already following him, and they should believe in him because they've come this far. That's a great, great question. Yeah, so why does why does his disciples not like they've already been following him for three years? Get this. This is it says if, at the end of this it says when the, the days of Passover were at hand, right? So this is like a week and a half before Jesus, or maybe two weeks or three weeks before Jesus dies on the cross. Right? So this is like this is this is moments before. So this is three years into his ministry. So why do his disciples not believe in him? Right? There's a great question. And I think it goes to, the, to our humanness, right? That there's a lot within us that we can experience, but there's a lot of things that, that there's a lot of hesitancy to believe that Jesus can actually do these things. Right? Because it, in one sense, it's not normal. It's not normal that people rise from the dead. Right? It's, it's normal that people die and they stay dead. <laughs> right? Like, this isn't the only instance that he rose from somebody from the dead. There was a little girl in Mark, uh, um, Jairus' daughter, Mark 6, I think, where he says, Talitha kum, little girl arise. There's the widow of Nain, where she, there's like a funeral procession. Funeral procession. Funeral is already in procession. Jesus walks up, touches the casket, and the kid sits up. <laughs> I have a 92-year-old funeral or a woman for a funeral tomorrow. Like, can you imagine if I, like, go up, touch the casket? She sits up. Like, it'd be crazy. And now we do a bunch of embalming and all this stuff. Like, those, that would be amazing. It would be absolutely amazing. And I, and I don't take it out of the realm of possibility that Christ wants to raise people from the dead. Um, he did it. And what does he say? He says, you will do greater things than these. Hmm. Hmm. Can we just sit with that? Jesus says, you will do greater things than what I have done here on earth. He walked on water. He multiplied bread and fish. He rose people from the dead. He healed blind people. He fixed a man with a withered hand. Like, you're going to do greater things than this. Mm. I'd say we're not living in the, in the Holy Spirit a whole lot. Like, that's, 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 that's a call for us. But I think that the reason that, that they're... There's still like a hardness of heart, right? Even, let's go even a week and a half later, what happens is that they deny him, that they run away from him. The man who was supposed to be the savior, Peter denies, Judas betrays, and the rest of them flee and hide except for John, right? So the question even goes deeper as to why even at the moment of his death do they hide? Because perhaps something within them didn't fully believe that he was who he says he was. But that's, that's, that's where Pentecost comes in. Pentecost comes in and gives them all the, the, the men who are living in fear. All of a sudden, what happens? They go out and they change the world. They were living in fear. They locked themselves in a room. And Jesus walked through the wall and breathed the Spirit upon them and gave them courage to go out. So, so the question is good because it, it, it gets to where we're at. Perhaps the question is, why are we not experiencing power and resurrection and healings and miracles that Jesus said we would. And I think it's because there's still doubt within us, that there's still an understanding of Jesus as a good guy and as somebody who's come to, to let us experience butterflies in our stomach, right? But he's like, no, 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 I've come for something greater. I've come to expand your understanding of who I am and what I can do. Yeah, other questions? Good question. Yeah, there's a, there's a couple times in this chapter where it says, you know, Jesus became mature. Yeah. I don't know if there's a different translation for that, but does that mean he seemed like a pretty emotional, controlled guy? <laughs> yeah. Was yeah. Just angry, or what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that's the perturbedness. At, I, I'd have to. That again. Can you remind me what, what verse? Uh, and 33 and in 38. And Jesus, oh yeah, we have here, Jesus deeply moved again. So my, my translation says deeply moved again. And what was the first one, 33? 
No. Yes? When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Um, and so I, I think a, a very common, a common translation is perturbed. Um, and my interpretation of that is that he was perturbed at the lack of faith, right? Like even, even when he's with um, the guys in the, in the boat and he, they wake him up and they're like, Jesus, we're going to die. And he's like, oh, you men of little faith, right? <laughs> like you could see there's like a frustration or like a, a like a, uh, like how many times do we have to go over this? Like I am life. <laughs> like we're not going to die. Uh, so there's like perhaps a, a weariness, like perturbedness comes from like a weariness. Um, and I think this translation, uh, the RSV is said to be a closer translation, deeply moved um, and troubled, right? Deeply moved and troubled at perhaps their lack of faith or deeply moved by the weeping that it does cause him to weep, right? He's deeply moved by what's happening. Um, but I think the word perturbed, uh, I like that, that I thought that's a new American. I, I like that it says that because we don't hear Jesus being perturbed very often. <laughs> and so like, it gives us like permission. It's like, oh, Jesus got perturbed too, right? He flipped tables. Yeah, he got angry sometimes, right? So like, um, all in healthy ways. Uh, and so we have to understand that in his context. But I think that perturbed at, at their lack of faith, but also just deeply moved by their, by, their, by their love for Lazarus. Thanks for the question. Other questions? What was the name of that movie? I didn't even get to that. Taken. Taken. I quoted it last time, too. I'm just going to keep throwing it out there. We should have a movie night. <laughs> Of taken, and then we can talk about it. See, the thing is that people watch movies and they're like, "No, it's rated R. We can't watch it." It's like, no, like some some good can actually be taken from it, right? Now we don't want to watch like, I'm a, I'm against like watching horror movies and like being like, "What good can be taken from the horror movie?" It's like everybody dies, like <laughs> like everybody's taken and killed and all these things. Like, no, like there's some something that the Lord can teach us in these movies, um, right? Movie is just another another form of art. Right? And so we understand that art throughout the centuries, the Lord always used to, to draw us through our senses into a deeper mystery. So stories, books, movies, paintings, all of those things, God wants to use to use our senses, hearing, seeing, tasting, feeling, experiencing, um, to draw us into a deeper understanding of who he is. It's good stuff. All right. Well, praise be to God. You guys have a great night. Drive safe. And uh, may Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming out.